Hello, and welcome back to the Restore Our Planet podcast for our second conversation with me, your host, Jack Cole. And today I'll be talking with an old friend I've known for over a decade, David Barr. We met at university when we were both studying environmental sciences. David's gone on to work and research in a number of countries across the world, such as Indonesia, Bangladesh, Malawi, and where he is now in South Africa. He works in aquaculture and has been investigating the sustainability benefits or the trends therein as to see where we might be heading in terms of fisheries, feeding the planet, feeding poorer communities, etc. If you like the conversation or you'd like to support us, please head over to restoreplant.org where you can make a donation. Or if you want to keep up to date with all the work we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. That'll be under Restore Our Planet. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hello to everyone listening. I'm here with Mr. David Barr, who's in Southern Africa. Uh, how's it going? Fantastic. Great to be here with you, Jack. Cheers. Cheers for having me on the podcast. Good, good. It's good to have you. So can you please give everyone a bit of a background of why you're out there, what you're up to, and what brings you here? Sure. So I'll give you a whistle-stop tour of my my uh, my kind of education and experience that's to date. So I, I mean, I've always been a bit of a greenie, um, love nature, collecting beetles, looking at birds, at wildlife on my bedroom wall as a kid. Um, and from that, I decided I wanted to study um, ecology and conservation, uh, which is also where we met. Okay. Um, and, uh, and from there, um, much like everyone realizes when you're a student, you don't really know that much about anything. And unfortunately, in the world, you can't learn about everything and you can't do everything. So you have to pigeonhole yourself to a certain extent. And I guess having that passion for conservation um, really reached the tipping point when I was exposed to, um, to, I guess, things that were going wrong in fisheries. Um, and this is where, for my undergrad dissertation, I was um, I was doing some research as part of a longer study that had been going on for, well, it, it's just wrapped up now after I think 15 years. Um, so I was within the first five years or so of that research. And it was looking at artisanal fishing methods um, in a national park in Southern Indonesia. And it really whet my interest in aquaculture because I had the privilege of meeting someone that was doing some pilot scale um, seaweed farming, um, which was for high end export to the Philippines. And, um, and that alongside my supervisor at undergrad, um, kind of nudging me in the direction of aquaculture and saying, this is something that you might find really interesting. I, I saw aquaculture, so that is the, the farming or the culture of aquatic organisms, whether that's plants or animals. I saw that as a bit of a solution to the catastrophe of what is industrial fishing for what, whoever has seen Sea Spiracy. I think we might come on to that at some point. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely. Want to, I want to be able to save the face of aquaculture, hopefully, because it's not all bad. Please don't, don't stop eating salmon and other farmed fish, um, etc. But um, so that that led me on to studying a master's um, also in sustainable aquaculture um, and the real aim with this was trying to find a a way of um, stopping people eating fish from destructive methods um, and b helping people to make money in a sustainable way um, out of a bread basket which is currently underutilized which is the ocean, but from a farming perspective. So from a controlled precision agriculture perspective, um, which is where aquaculture is going. Um, and it, I know it gets a huge amount of bad press um, in the media, um, but I really, really do think a lot of that is misguided. Um, and again, we can we can come on to this, but yeah, so I'm, I'm an aquaculture specialist now. I've been, been working as an aquaculture consultant and project manager throughout mostly Southern Africa um, for the last six years. I'm currently in South Africa, but I'm on my way to Malawi um, en route to managing another project there. Um, so yeah, that's a roundabout. No, that's, yeah, nice. That's, but, nice, um, that's a nice uh, place to kick things off. So tell us a little bit about, why do you think it gets a bad press? I think, 
I think, unfortunately, the short answer is it deserves it in certain circumstances. Um, unfortunately, though, things are never as simple as people make them out to be. So, I mean, you know about this as well. It, it, people will paint something with a brush um, as long as it meets their agenda. Um, and unfortunately for some people, whether they're on the environmental side or the animal welfare side or food quality side, they do have a genuine message when it comes to malpractice in aquaculture historically. Um, certainly, let's use the Scottish salmon industry as an example. There are still portions of the Scottish salmon industry that probably don't use best practices. And that means that from an environmental and animal health, animal welfare perspective, there are there are issues, but the beauty of the transparency in media um, and the free market is also that this means that these producers need to they need to improve, they need to get better, and this is the message I would bring. It's that when you bring in certification, when you bring in transparency along the value chain, um, and when when people want to buy the best quality product. And obviously that means it's going to be a healthy and happy product. Um, you need to bring in better controls of the industry. And that is generally the trend. And I would say when you compare um, aquaculture against other livestock agriculture, um, the gains, the improvements that have been made um, over the last two decades outstrip <laughs> the other types of animal agriculture by centuries. Could you be um, a little bit more specific about some of those malpractices mm, and how sure. things have changed over the last few decades? Yeah, well, I think, so for example, if we're looking at, uh, let's look at an intensive cage system for Scottish salmon, let's say, um, that basically means that you have a large net that is enclosed, often in a sea lock or, or further out to sea. Um, although increasingly they're trying to bring it on land, and I'll come, I'll come back to that. Um, but the problems that you might have is when you're intensively feeding fish in that environment, um, it means that you have to be really smart with how much feed that you're using because the primary source of, of feed for the fish is, is, is coming from the feed, the formulated feed, so pellets. That you're, that you're feeding to the fish, however many times a day that would be, depending on the system that you're using, and that can vary. Um, but if there is uneaten feed, for example, that will sink through um, the cage um, and it can, it, it settles on the seabed and then that can cause, let's just say, not so nice chemical reactions to happen and then you get oxygen changes in the oxygen level of the water maybe die off of the plants that were there before um a change in the change in the biodiversity i guess and then also there's there's obviously um uh fish can escape um so you might have situations where um there are fish that have not necessarily genetically modified but I would say they've been um, selectively bred, certainly. Um, and then if you have them interacting with wild fish stocks, then that can cause um, that can cause issues. But these, so those are environmental things. Um, from a fish health perspective, a very well known case with, with salmon is sea lice. And these are parasitic louse that live on the live all over the skin of salmon and they cause horrible sores um, and can cause distress to the fish certainly um, and that they do occur in nature it's just when you when you have thousands of fish in a confined environment it's obviously going to increase the spread and it can increase the spread spread to wild populations as well but a huge amount of funding and research um, through through universities in Scotland, across the rest of the UK, Europe, US, um, in, in Asia as well. This is just for salmon. Um, huge amount of funding and expertise is going into finding solutions for these issues. Um, and 
I think the the improvements that are seen over the last couple of decades, as I said, is is huge. Um, and from a conservation point of view, I mean, I I became fascinated in aquaculture because I thought this is a solution to the decimation of fish stocks. And it was only when I really started to study aquaculture more and work in the industry more that I realized that actually from a from a human nutrition point of view, if if people want to continue eating meat and if we just look at an efficiency point of, from an efficiency perspective, there's there's no competitor to fish when it comes to feed conversion ratios, when it comes to speed of delivery from from farm to fork. Um, and I mean, just just from the fact that it doesn't other than the water that it's living in, you don't have to you don't have to water fish. You don't have to give them water. Whereas if you look at a if you look at a cow or a pig or a sheep or a chicken and you look at their water demand, it's quite staggering. And that's before you even get to heat and food. Um, so from an efficiency point of view, fish can't really be beaten. Um, obviously, it varies by species. But it really can be um, a silver bullet to a certain extent, um, particularly in other parts of the world. I mean, well, I'm sat in South Africa, you're sat in England right now. But in for a lot of people across Asia, um, certainly Asia, where fish demand is vast, um, it can be it can be a solution and it is a solution. Um, and I'd say that's really marked by the point that in 2014, I think it was 2014, aquaculture actually surpassed capture fisheries in terms of global fish supply. So we're now farming more fish than we are catching. Um, and that's not just because we, the fish stocks are declining, it's because aquaculture is going up and up and up. Right, because what, what I think in the, the overall wider public psyche is the seas are emptying very <clears> quickly. <throat> Something needs to be done about this. So essentially, you're saying that if we move towards aquaculture, which is the kind of the farming of fish more directly, mm. more controlled, that could counter and supplant seeing fishing yeah. as we see it today. Yeah, that's the that's the general gist. I, I think we'll come on to the, It's not that straightforward. And I guess we'll come on to this a little bit. Maybe we can talk about this a little bit more. But I say silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet. It won't fix everything. And you you can't fix the myriad of livelihoods that are involved with the fisheries value chain. You can't replace those with aquaculture. It's not that straightforward. Um, quite literally hundreds of millions of people who are reliant on artisanal small scale fisheries around the world and um, for, for income, primary income, but also food security. Be, before we even get to like basic carbohydrates, I mean, the, the, the fishermen that I was interviewing and 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 um, doing research with um, in in Wakatobi in Indonesia over ten well ten years ago, um, these 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 families um, they they couldn't grow crops where they were because the soils weren't suitable for for the crops that they would have liked to have grown, and for a lot of the year they couldn't really afford to buy rice or cassava. So they were getting their carbohydrate from the fish that they were eating. And obviously we think of meat as being a protein source, but it also provides other macronutrients. And they their carbohydrates were coming from their fish, which I it's just, it's heartbreaking and it's crazy um, that that is what it is. Um, but that was one that was one of my main motivations looking at aquaculture. It's if we can provide fish at a good price um, that is market sensitive and is going to fit with people's nutritional needs, um, then hopefully we can try and fix that situation, not for everyone, but hopefully on a, on a you know, sectoral level, at least. How was Indonesia? Beautiful. Yeah. Abs absolutely stunning. Um, it was a real privilege. It was with an amazing organization called Operation Wallacea. Um, they run research research trips for undergraduate um, MSc and I think PhD students um, all over. It's not just it's not just marine. They also do terrestrial conservation work as well. 
Um, but I think primarily they started off as a marine um, research NGO charity. Um, but um, it was very, very special. Being there with the organization obviously gave access to being in the depths of the Wakatobia National Park and staying on this research base. And I, I have to say, it, it really was one of the most incredible experiences. And as a, as a diver as well, being able to dive in that kind of environment, there aren't many places like it left. Um, scuba diving. Uh, scuba diving, yeah. Scuba diving and snorkeling. But, but yeah, that it's that that coral reef area is absolutely stunning. And I mean, I compare that with what it's like in Thailand. Um, it can't be compared. Um, there aren't many. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't claim to be a. Um, I've dived quite a lot, but I'm not. I'm not someone who's done hundreds and hundreds of hours. Um, but I have I'm seen zero. the difference between <laughs> do it before they disappear because they are going to disappear. Right. It is happening. And okay. It's, it's heartbreaking. Okay, so you're now in Southern Africa. So tell us a little bit how you ended up there, your journey. Sure. So, so I finished off my master's in 2015, um, and I did some work with a fisheries and aquaculture consultancy in the UK. Um, and then, quite coincident, it was fortuitous. You know those turn, those the stars the aligned. Events, the stars aligned, and. Um, the God spoke. And yeah, and this and a, and a guy that I'd that I'd known well from from Sterling and the Masters. He he was in a year above me, but we'd also done we'd both done research in Bangladesh, and he was working for a um, economic development consultancy. He was doing work for their UK office, but they they have offices throughout Africa as well. This is Imani Development, who I um, who I worked then went on to work for for. The next five years um, across southern Africa, but based in Malawi. So he he got me involved with that consultancy, and it was quite it was quite interesting because he he kind of popped up on my Facebook and asked if I would be interested in taking over um, a project that he had been been managing for I guess the year before, and it was a it was a small scale fish farm tilapia, so a type of bream, um, and they were growing these tilapia in the sugarcane cooperative in southern southern Malawi um, as a way of improving the protein intake of the people in that in that cooperative um, and he asked if I would be interested in managing this farm um, and it was a, a year-long contract and then uh, kind of see see what happens after and I thought yeah let's let's go for it let's let's see what happens. So you had uh, a few interesting run-ins in Malawi would you like to uh, tell us a little bit about that mm. or those Mm. yeah yeah well I mean I think it was it it's a very very interesting time very very interesting I I mean Af Malawi is called the warm heart of Africa and it really really is it it's beautiful um for any any people listening who maybe haven't heard of Malawi or um or don't know where it is it's it's in southeast Africa um just to the east of Zambia and Zimbabwe um, west of Mozambique and Tanzania. It's landlocked, but it has the third largest African lake. Um, I think it's the ninth biggest lake in the world. Um, and it's famous for its cichlid fish, which are, um, well, it's, it's called adaptive radiation, but microevolution, where kind of like Darwin's finches, but on a much grander scale, where you go from having a few founding species, uh, which are very common, um, uh, mm, very similar species and then out of that there have grown to be hundreds of species um, so it's the most it's the most it's I think it is the biggest example of adaptive radiation or um or this type of evolution in the world and there's now I think over 800 confirmed different species in Malawi but I would encourage anyone listening to go on google and just search and have a look and see what the lake looks like see what the country looks like um, it's it's an amazing amazing place and when people can travel more easily i would say forget about other um, no i would encourage people to go to lots of african countries but malawi is one that people yeah. should absolutely consider it's it's beautiful yeah and yeah interesting stories um well i can say one okay so one just as an example which is also 
a real it kind of gives you an introduction into the challenges of working in the development space as well because this was indirectly the the farm where i was working had received funding from the eu um, as well as um, other donors um, including the british government through private sector development funds um, and therefore we had very tight controls over how we could sell and distribute the fish that we grew um, and I know this is something that we've talked about before in terms of like how you can be pragmatic in your approach to development and sustainability. And it's it's not as easy as you want it to be. Before David it came be. on, uh, he and I were speaking about uh, sort of approaches to a lot of the challenges faced. And we were just talking about how we feel sometimes in the conservation, uh, sustainable world, there can be a lot of over philosophizing rather than pragmatism, which is what he's referring to there. But please go on. Yeah. No, 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 thanks. And, and so we, we were harvesting um, two ponds um, on this day, which, which equated to, uh, off the top of my head, hundreds of kilos of fish, hundreds of kilos of fish. And we, we set up orders with managers at a nearby, nearby sugar estate, um, who, who, who'd said, well, I'll, I'll come and I'll buy five kilos or 10 kilos, whatever. Um, and it got, it got to, a, so when you're harvesting fish in this environment, because it's, it, it gets very, very hot by 9 30, 10 o'clock in the morning, you're pushing mid to high thirties. Um, and unless you have good shade, the water temperatures are just soaring. So, um, for the, for the welfare of the fish, um, but also to make sure that you keep their quality as high as you possibly can. You harvest them very early in the morning and you try and keep them in cooler water so that you can keep them in slightly higher densities because you're, you're lowering, lowering their biological oxygen demand. Um, so they're not as active because they're cold, basically. Fish aren't like us, they're not warm blooded. They need, their body temperature is regulated by the water that they're in um, and their activity is regulated by the water that they're in. So you harvest them earlier in the day you get them in the tanks and then the hope is that the people people come and and buy their their allocation of fish unfortunately due to various different circumstances various different circumstances um we we had a lot of fish left over um by lots i mean tens of kilos so bags full of, of fish and um it's a live it, unfortunately head. It, it's dead at this point because this is kind of into the afternoon the fish have um suffocated basically um because you you can't just keep on changing the water the hope is that everyone will have come and bought the fish by midday um but it's also a learning it's a learning process um the farm wasn't that old at this stage and 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 we were naively optimistic about how the market setup would work um but then it, it got to the point where some of the a portion of the fish were the staff and other people at the cooperative still wanted to be able to take this fish. But because the fish wasn't fresh and because there was a risk of contamination, um, not I don't think it was much of a risk, to be honest, at all. Having I mean, it, for anybody that's traveled to lots of parts of the world, you'll realize that fish is kept fresh by spraying water or spraying formalin, formaldehyde is the main thing. And it is stored for days. Fresh fish doesn't mean fresh fish. It could, it could be, it could be a, as, as long as it's not rotting, it, it can be fresh. And so we being under being under the, the, the control of, of, of these donors, obviously we, we, we couldn't give this fish away we couldn't sell it to these staff because it wasn't deemed safe and it was heartbreaking we 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 had to burn it and this is where you're you're burning good fish in front of poor africans who have also been farming this fish themselves um 
and it was a learning it was a learning experience it was a the obvious experience. uh sorry to interrupt the obvious well, hopefully mm. obvious to me anyway question here might be for those listening slash watching is why couldn't we just give those fish away to supposedly quite poor if, locals if some if somebody got if somebody got sick um if if somebody had a problem that was caused by that fish um it it would have created it would have created significant issues um partly because that person obviously that person would have got sick and i don't think that would have happened um but the, there was a risk and this is the unfortunate case for a lot of i mean i it's not it's not the last time that i've seen a situation like that where development agencies are bound by the expectations and protocols of their home offices. Is there just a slightly a side question? Were there any mm. other forms of perhaps more sustainable, not more sustainable, but other alternative sustainable methods that you that the locals use, for example, in Malawi, that you've adapted or that you've witnessed? Or is it generally well, think- more of an outsider? been brought in techniques so fish farming is not fish farming is not something that is it's it's not something that historically has been um there isn't a there isn't a a long history of a small scale fish farming it's something that was introduced in the early 20th century um largely um in a similar way to how it was introduced across Southern Asia, um, where it was kind of smallholder um, family pond integrated systems, um, which I think is a. Okay, apologies to everyone listening or watching. Uh, David's uh, headphones decided to fail, um, but it's okay. We're back. So, David, once again, you're talking about how there really is no, what you might refer to possibly indigenous or older form of uh, agriculture and fisheries which you say was brought yeah. in the early 20th century so go ahead yeah sure so it's um it's not like um i mean if, if you can see from records that aquaculture has been practiced in southeast asia china for perhaps thousands of years in, in different in different guises but um certainly for malawi not the case. So um, the, the the previous kind of agenda of the um, development community, I guess, if you could call it the development community, where that would be the development arm of um, colonial expansion, um, was towards this idea of um, the family pond and integrated systems, which works really, really well from sustainable sustainability point of view. The, the idea is that you have um, fish in the pond and you feed the fish with garden garden waste and, and household waste and sometimes um, human and, and animal um, feces as well. Um, funny story about that, actually, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, but, <laughs> but the idea is that you have this circular circular system where you feed the pond, the fish eat what's in the pond because you're not necessarily farming predatory fish. You might be farming, um, you're farming herbivorous fish or omnivorous fish that live off um, the, the, the zooplankton, phytoplankton that's developed in the water by, um, uh, by using the fertilizer or by, um, by using plants or, or different things. Um, and then the, the nutrient rich green water from the pond is then um, at the time of harvest or partial harvest of the fish, you will let that water out and you'll use it for irrigating your, your fields to, to grow cash crops or, or food crops for your home. Um, and this is something that we were, we were emulating this to a certain extent at the, at the farm that I was managing, um, where it was a re- it was a really nice setup. So the outflow for each of these ponds would feed into um, vegetable plots for, for for different types of crops. And there, there was rice, there was bananas, there was pigeon peas, there was 
um, sweet potatoes, there was maize. Um, so these were all, for around the ponds, these were all primarily foods which were an ex extension of what the farmers would be able to do on their own, their own land. Um, but the setup of the cooperative was you give your land to the cooperative and you will make dividends from the sugarcane twice a year, um, which is, it's called the Pata Sugarcane Cooperative in Malawi. It, it's considered one of the best examples of how cooperative development can work. Um, Fantastic. Quickly, yeah. Dave, I wouldn't want us to miss out on your uh, Bangladesh regale. So, Oh, Bangladesh. Okay. The so just very, very quickly, the this is this was a this is a funny story where um, I was I was eating some fish um, in Bangladesh as you do, and um, sitting on the floor eating, eating the, the family of a, a friend who managed this farm that I was uh, happened. It was again just stars align and you end up making an amazing friendship with someone and very bizarre circumstances. But I'm eating this eating this this fish curry and I was thinking, oh, this is absolutely delicious this is wonderful this is fantastic yeah how are you feeding your fish and he said well um there's 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 the cow poo there's the the formulated food and and also we we have the you know we have the, the toilets for the farm over each of the fish ponds so those fish were being fed human human food um <laughs> pieces secret or ingredients or nice oil so it's full green this is this is the true circular production system where you eat the fish you poo the fish they eat your you, you get the idea but as long as you purge the fish um which is put submerging it in in really really clean water um as long as you do that before eating it so after harvest the i mean this is something that Okay, right. People. Sorry, I, I thought you were talking it's more of... It's, it's normal, but it's quite okay. odd. Yeah. That's all right. We're all very open-minded here. Sorry, when you said purge, I thought you meant more of like evil spirits or... Some sort no. Of <laughs> of, uh... <laughs> okay. Well, kind right. of, but you're getting rid of those horrible microbes that may be in the fish. Good. Demons. Um, <laughs> good, good. Okay, so you and I met uh, 10 years ago? Over 10 years ago. Over 10 so, years ago. Uh, 2010, yeah. Young men, bright eyes, hot-blooded ready to take on the world chasing insects around chasing insects around southern france yeah lepidopteras uh <laughs> still optimistic i think it depends i think it depends <laughs> on i think it depends on the timeline i mean this is something okay. that we this is something that we were talking about before so yes um i think that i mean if we we look let's look at this year you know, this year we've had this important summit and things are being, politicians are talking more and more about climate change. This year is one of the hottest, it is the hottest year on record. Half of Russia is burning. The Amazon burn. Turkey, uh, Algeria, obviously Australia list, famously last year, year before. Uh, the list Savannas, just goes on. Yep. Yeah. And anyone that has watched um, Mexico, a life California. On our planet. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. exactly. David Attenborough, a life on our planet. Um, his mission statement, wonderful, wonderful um, doc on uh, Netflix. Fantastic. Everyone needs to watch it. Um, it depends on how you frame optimism. <laughs> am I am I optimistic? As pessimism. Yeah, go. Ahead. I'm not. I wouldn't say. Yeah, I. I am optimistic that things can continue to get better in certain circumstances. I'm not gonna to claim to understand what climate change is and how it's working. All I can see is that in my lifetime, the list of species that are not there as much as they were before is going up. I and should probably just quickly interject there and say, you do know what climate change is. I mean, uh, I do know what climate change is. Not, not I do, as a, yeah. a denier. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, I'm not yeah, denying yeah. it at all. No, no, course, it's, quite obvious, it's quite obviously happening. And it's quite obviously, in, yeah, it's quite obviously yeah. influenced heavily 
um, whether or not completely caused, but very, very heavily influenced by human activity. We're living in the Anthropocene, aren't we? As it's now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Indeed. So yeah. what are your... Yeah. Am I optimistic? Not particularly, but it depends on what you mean by optimistic. Okay. Well, let's break it down. So you've mentioned and illustrated how agriculture is improving. Um, mm. Yeah. And, you know, and obviously with modern technology, uh, media, ideas can spread. Um, education is expanding, everyone's information sharing. As I've been asking, you've been hesitating a little bit. What's the root of those hesitances? The, doom, the doomsday clock. I think for, Time scale. for any, yeah. So for any of us right. who have heard of what the doomsday clock is, basically how close are we to 12 o'clock, to midnight? Midnight, yeah. How, and, and I think we're pretty close. <laughs> I can't remember. I think it's shifted in the last year. I think yes. they've moved it again. How, I don't. I can't remember how long they've been doing it for. Yeah, I think so, it's a Cold War phenomenon. Scientists yeah. and obviously boffins got together and factors. yeah. Sorry, excuse me, but um, yeah. You say is that more of a sort of wider political? Sorry, to interrupt. Is that more of a sort of wider political uh, anxiety over, say, for example, Iran and sort of things that aren't actually related to conservation? Our our field and. Obviously, the approach is comp- Is it more of a kind of like a wider, you know, what's going on with really. Trump and or China yeah. or anything like that? No, not I, that. it's not so much that. It's more, and, and it's not so much that. It's more that it's kind of like um, uh, trying to think of a good, a good, good analogy or metaphor, but just it's like when you, if some, if you find yourself in a situation where, where that situation, whatever that situation is, let, let's say it's, um, let's just say a dinner party, for example, and everything is really, really good. Everything's really, really good. And you're having a great time and you think, I wish this could last forever. And then for whatever reason, circumstances change and things start to deteriorate and you realize that not only is it not going to last forever, it's, it, 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 like, it isn't going to, and the bad things are starting to happen, and you think, right, well, I'm just going to leave. The problem is we don't have another planet, and there are now lots of different things outside of what humans are doing. So outside of a nuclear holocaust, things are really bleak. Um, if, if I was reading a report last week, which was talking about the inevitability of sea level rise based on the two degree um, average increase. And, and, and now they're seeing that a one and a half degree increase is not good. Like that's not a success story. <laughs> I feel like this is the problem because politics, mm. this is something that a lot of greenies cry on about. I mean, I'm one of them, but I, you can I, say cry on about it, right? They're there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's um, utopia. Yeah, more, to, to, more, sorry. let me help you. More on a sort of the utopian end of uh, environmental mm, movement, we might say. I don't, yeah, like, I don't believe in a utopia where everything works yeah. out. On, on, I, I don't. I don't. I think we've we've kind of had it, and it wasn't great for a lot of people as well. Like, it was great for a very small group of people in global terms, and very very damaging and not great for a lot of other people. Also, I guess, similarly for you, having spent the best part of the last decade not in Europe and not in the West in general, but in other parts of the, I don't like using the, the phrase, but the developing world. I think the global south is as in the way global it's south, how, how terms have evolved. Global south. I'd Ignoring prefer. Australia and New Zealand, obviously, but... Uh, well, yeah. Um, anyway, go ahead. It's... The development that is happening in the in the global south doesn't necessarily happen under any control of the green agenda, and quite I'm not, it's quite the opposite. And it, and it has to be because we collectively, as Western people who are who are incredibly privileged by the the damaging acts of previous generations. Um, which I wouldn't say that we're to blame for because we weren't there, we didn't make those decisions, but we are responsible for d- 
doing the best that we can. You know, I feel For like those who come a, after us, of we course. have a responsibility. Well, yeah, I think something that you're um, you're uh, yeah. alluding to there is the fact that, of course, you know, previous generations in the West, it was pretty dreadful anyway, and. There were certain processes which we thought would, which, which which did, as you mentioned, for a small, or at least a part of the the global population, really did, you know, improve things for. I mean, let's be honest, a lot of people. I mean, you know, in the West, like our, that. you know, a lot of millions and millions of people's lives were improved over previous generations. However, yeah, um, yeah, uh, there have been unforeseen costs and a little bit of willingness to overlook some of those. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's very it's very interesting because I think the last two years, um, or the last eight, you know, yeah, twenty months since the beginning of twenty twenty one. I mean, remember before March, everyone thought, "Wow, this is a terrible year because of <laughs> locusts, oh. wildfires, <laughs> and 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 a bunch of other things that were headline news." And then they all got forgotten because of the, this pandemic. Yeah. And um, and the horrible reality is that a lot of people in in, in Europe and the, I mean, in the US, it's different. They have horrible and Australia, they have horrible wildfires every year in North America and Australia and, and across Russia. Um, but now with the flooding that has happened um, over the last couple of months in, in, in Western Europe, um, continental Western, Western Europe, there's this reality check, um, which I think a lot of those, a lot of people in those countries maybe were, were realizing anyway. But I don't, I don't know if they, they're really getting it fast. I mean, we as well, we're not getting it fast enough. The issues that are facing people from climate change and, and resource degradation, habitat loss, the list goes on. The impact, they. They're, they're happening hardest and fastest, fastest in the places where people are least resilient mm. to, to cope. Well, my, but now people yeah. in Europe are also facing that stuff. I mean, and, just to, and, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt again. Just to throw in another disaster, Mozambique flooded exactly. uh, last year. I don't, I didn't mean, yeah, I well, it was actually a couple of times. I was actually, yeah. I was, I was in, I was in Malawi um, when it was, yeah, Cyclone Idai. Um, um, hit. Um, yeah, it was Mo it was Mozambique, it was Eastern Zimbabwe, it was Malawi. The farm that I had worked on was completely flooded, completely submerged. Um, and, and you, you uh, also mentioned you spent some time in Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh really is mm, on the front lines of climate change. There, uh, because it's quite a flat country and obviously yeah, incredibly overpopulated yeah. or heavily mm. populated. Um, and their farmlands are salinating, is that the correct word? Exactly, um, yeah, 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 yeah. And they're really yeah. on the front lines. Um, yeah. Okay, so- and It's agriculture really hard. It, it, right. Really, um, really interesting. Um, and obviously, again, obviously this is, we're talking here in um, mid 2021. There's obviously a lot of, and for a variety of reasons, a lot of uh, migration happening, a lot of refugees, which is just increasing, increasing. Yeah, um, and and that's, that's not even, that's, we're not even talking about climate change now directly. No. And this is obviously, uh, yeah. again, we don't want to go into geopolitics, with, but um, what's happening in Afghanistan, et cetera. But uh, mm. places like Bangladesh, places like Southern Africa, um, I keep beginning to see real levels of uh, migration that have frankly never happened before. Um, hundreds, hundreds of millions of people, potentially. Um, but it, it, it's, I, I think this is, I guess this is the point of the doomsday clock. It's like people always think, well, what happens when it reaches midnight? Is it suddenly like there's a complete <laughs> catastrophe? No one I mean, wakes I, up tomorrow. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in the camp that kind of says, well, what do you, what do you class as a catastrophe and because catastrophe and, and which catastrophe that is happening now, are you not seeing for you to think that it's a good right. But um, no, I mean, I am, I am, I am optimistic about, I mean, I'm a gem, generally, I am an optimistic person. I, um, I, I'm also like, one of my favorite phrases is don't necessarily trust happiness. It's, it's like a fart in the wind. You know, yeah, yeah, it, I, I very much agree with you. My, uh, 
my other Don't. half often gets a little bit cross with me when I tell her that happiness is a meaningless goal because it's yeah. fleeting. Yeah, it's um, something you enjoy okay. along the way. Well, my, my, my sense of the future generally is we're in for a pretty rough 20 to 30 years, I think. Um, but, 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 but the big but, there's too many. Uh, here's, here's something we, we spoke about the kind of the, what you might refer to as the green utopians. And again, there's always, there's always a, a place for everybody. You know, everyone's just trying to do the right thing, mostly. Um, but there, there have been over the last, you know, at least several decades, mm. a real kind of mustering and rallying of very intelligent, very dedicated, very brave, yeah. committed people have been working on these mm. problems, working on these technologies. And often it's just, you know, uh, poorer communities in Malawi, for example, or mm. um, tree planters in Peru. Obviously, where I spent a lot of time. Uh, people are mobilizing. People knows, know, know what's going on. Um, and the fact that those people exist and have existed for a long time, not really that interested in so much, uh, you know, being seen as doing good because they would just rather just do do it in the, doing, the shadows. And, yeah, they, and a lot of these people don't get enough uh, spotlight because they frankly don't want it. But because that is, there are so many people, especially with, I mean, our generation, Yes, but especially kids coming up now. Um, as I say, I think we're in for a, a bit of a rough 20 to 30 years, but there's enough people, I think, a critical mass that will get through it, really is how I, gen I generally see it. Um, so yeah. Dave, we've had a really, really interesting chat, actually, at least I think so. Um, <laughs> no, thanks um, for having me on. I feel but, like we could, we could have carried on talking. But, been, but, been, but well, I... Well, I was just going to say, any, any, um, you've obviously uh, taught me a lot about aquaculture, something I knew very little about, um, other than listening to your wonderful presentation that you sent me last night with your beautiful uh, voice. Um, and um, yeah, is there anything, any final words you'd like to speak to? Yeah, well, I think, I think, um, I think I would, I would like to, I'd like to end with something optimistic. I think I am. Always a good I idea. Reiterate. I am generally optimistic about things. And I think particularly people, people think about what can I do? How can I help? What can I, what impact can I really make in my day-to-day -day life? And I think this is where this, this, this is where I'd like to leave it. And I'll leave it with, with like a aquaculture or fisheries-esque kind of angle. Try and consume responsibly and be part of the movement towards system change within the value chain. So the value chain being the beginning is kind of in very, very simplistic terms. You do have people before this, but if you have the producer of a product and then it goes all the way to the consumer um, and all of the different people that are involved and all of the different companies and the way that transactions happen across that value chain. As a consumer of, of any product, you are critical to what happens to the next product that is being produced that you haven't yet consumed. And there's, as we've talked about a little bit, we've touched on, there are these improvements in, trans in transparency and traceability and in, in quality control. And just, I would encourage people to, to, to go and look at the fish traffic light system, for example, it's widely available within the UK. It's getting really, really good. And there are various different, um, I don't know if this is at, alive in the UK yet, but I know the WWF were previously looking into um, trying to tie up traceability fully within the value chain. So basically you do a QR scan on your, let's say, haddock, and it will give you a photo of the fisherman that caught that fish, or it will give you a picture of the farm where that fish was grown. Something to that effect. I don't know how far along they've got with that, but that's the that's the kind of direction that I think can be taken and is being taken by a lot of people in, in the fisheries and aquaculture value chain. Um, Just to quickly add to that, if, if I may, something I always found was very intelligent about the recycling movement wasn't so much of the efficiency 
which is to say, you know, because there was a lot of criticisms um, of, you know, is it taking just as much or if not more energy to recycle products than it is to, you know, um, yeah. just throw them away or or to reproduce them, etc. But yeah. something I think was very intelligent, and I don't know if this was on purpose or not, was in societies, and this is like, again, I'll say all over the world, but especially a large portion of the world, we're at a stage now that psychologically every single person has to make a environmental decision every time they throw something away. Which bin does this go in? Which, you know, is this plastic? Where do I recycle this? Where should this go? Mm -hmm. And the fact that, again, every single person, hopefully, the majority at least, um, is making that choice, even if they're not really an uh, environmentally minded person, they're making that decision two or three times a day. So it's just trip, trip, trip. And I think that ties into what you were saying about how people making those similar decisions with how they they purchase their their uh and consume their fish i think yeah if that's a little bit of yeah a... absolutely it's just make informed oh, decisions so make make okay. decisions based on a decision don't just you know don't don't just pick something up and, and put it in your right. put it in your bag um yeah. good think, Dave. think about it that but I, I mean i'd say that in general across all different things but specifically for fish i'm just going to focus in on fish and say Think about what it is that you're consuming and enjoy it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, brilliant, Dave. Thank you so much for your time. Now, in terms of um, where can people find you in your work, your organization, or so a uh, to shield and plug, basically. Yes. So probably what's easiest is I I can I can share my LinkedIn. I can also share my my email. Okay. Um, I'll put and... it in the show notes. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Brilliant. But, um, yeah. No, Mr. Bar. Been really good to really good to to see you again and to speak and um yeah pleasure thanks cheers old boy fantastic cheers cheers jack